Okay, thanks, Meredith, and uh, national year of caves and karst, as you've seen. Uh, and so it's a really a pleasure to be presenting to you some of the uh, some of the geologic history of the karst in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Virginia, of course, is the um, the, the the state that I live in. Uh, I am the current chair of the Virginia Cave Board, and one of the roles of the Cave Board is to do this kind of outreach. So I'm very happy to be here doing this today. Um, so, I'm, uh, like I said, I'll give you a bit of an overview of the history of the Shenandoah Valley Karst. It's not the only karst that exists in Virginia, and hopefully I'll touch about on uh, some of the other karst areas as well. And I'll just try to advance my slides here. Okay. So, we might start with the question, well, what is karst? Um, and you may hear various definitions or you may see various definitions written in textbooks or online. Um, here's one that I kind of like. Uh, karst is a landscape. Uh, it's a landscape with natural voids in the subsurface. And these voids result from the uh, dissolution of the bedrock. And the rocks uh, that are most prone to dissolving easily in water uh, are carbonate rocks. And those include limestones and dolostones and evaporites, uh, salt deposits or gypsum or anhydrite. These are mineral deposits that are laid down when often in, in uh, areas where closed uh, air, uh, basins or uh, depressions on the Earth's surface that may have been filled with seawater, they dry up over time in very arid climates and lay down these kinds of salt deposits. So you might think of the Great Salt Lake in Utah as one of those areas where you have big deposits of salt. And those build up over geologic time and get buried with other sediments. So they exist in the subsurface and they can dissolve and create voids. And the, uh, the landforms that are characteristic of these karst landscapes are uh, sinkholes uh, and caves, of course. And we saw a wonderful presentation by uh, Yvonne and Mark just a moment ago. Um, and these are all the, the, the result of the movement of water, groundwater, and surface water that interact with these, these rocks to dissolve them and create the voids in the subsurface um, and express these voids at the surface with these landforms. There's actually a lot of karst in the United States. Um, here's a map of, uh, some of uh, some of the areas that contain carbonate rocks, which are shown in the blue colors here. Uh, the evaporite rocks, the salt and the gypsum that I mentioned, those are shown in the greenish colors um, near the surface, where they occur near the surface. And the reds are showing places that we can we call pseudo-karst, or areas that have caves in rocks that aren't typically dissolving in water. They're, they're not prone to that, um, but they yield uh, voids in the subsurface from air, other geologic processes. And in this case, most of what we're seeing are, are basalt uh, lava flows. And when lava flows, um, across the Earth's surface and hardens on the surface where it's cool, it can often leave voids as the lava flows underground in lava tubes. And as the lava cools and hardens, you get these um, wonderful cave passages and underground voids in the lava. And so we consider that a type of pseudo-karst. Um, and we include it here on the map. Uh, if you add up all these areas, um, the carbonate rocks, the evaporite rocks, and then the pseudocarst, it's about a quarter of the country um, where you have uh, the ability to, to have karst landforms near or at the land surface. Um, but for the most part, it's the carbonate rocks and the evaporite rocks that are what we call the true karst, uh, the karst resulting from the solution of the rocks. Uh, so where does this word come from? Well, the word karst actually originated uh, over in Europe in the country of Slovenia, and it's a place name. Um, there's this area in southwestern Slovenia that's the Kras region. That's the word in, of, uh, in Slovene for the place name. Um, it borders the country of Italy uh, in the northeastern uh, corner of the Adriatic Sea, and it's a lovely, beautiful plateau of limestone uh, uplifted uh, by tectonic processes. And uh, it's a very thick package of rock and so large caves form within it. Um, as I mentioned, it's a place name called Kras. And uh, it was described back when the language of science in Europe at the time was German. 
And so the term, the Slovene term kras was Germanicized uh, into what we now use internationally as this term karst. Uh, but just bear in mind that it's the place name and that's where it comes from. So what's the karst in Slovenia look like? Well, as I mentioned, big thick packages of limestone um, uh, with uh, beautiful cave systems and underground streams flowing through it. This is the town of Kancian at the famous Skocin Caves in, in Slovenia, Skocianski Yama. Uh, and this is a big collapsed doline, line or, or uh, might think of it as a large sinkhole um, with a natural bridge separating the, uh, the flow path of the cave un underneath. And so this is a stream that's exiting out of a cave flowing underneath a sinkhole into across an, an underneath another natural bridge. Um, just beautiful, uh, enormous landforms. And as the water comes out of caves, of course, it's expressed at very large springs onto the land surface. And if you can then explore the caves underneath, you find all kinds of beautiful formations that we heard about in Yvonne and Mark's presentation previously. Um, and if you were to look at the land surface, uh, this is a, a LIDAR derived uh, topographic image. Um, LIDAR is sort of like taking a, a laser pointer uh, on an airplane and scanning the land surface with it. So you get a very high resolution uh, uh, model or image of the land surface. And these are all these, po these pockmarks are all deep sinkholes. Uh, here is a, is a highway for scale. So you can kind of see the highway here and then a smaller road. So some of these are very large closed depressions up on this plateau of limestone in the classical karst of Slovenia and Italy. But we also have some pretty remarkable karst in Virginia. Um, many of you who've been to Virginia may know of the iconic natural bridge, um, very similar to the natural bridge that I showed you previously that occurs in Slovenia. Uh, this was uh, described um, as far back as Thomas Jefferson, uh, and it's now a state park. Um, the, the water that is coming out of the ground carries with it the dissolved limestone and sometimes redeposits that limestone on the surface. And I'll talk more about that later, but this is a site where that's occurring actively at a place called Falling Spring Falls near Covington, Virginia. Beautiful, beautiful natural area. And this is Natural Tunnel State Park, another jewel of Virginia's karst lands uh, down in far southwestern Virginia. And again, if we are lucky enough to have these uh, LIDAR surveys through most of Virginia now, so we can see what the land surface looks like when we strip away the vegetation using these, um, these technologies, and we can see the pockmarked nature of uh, the landscape. It's not all that dissimilar from the classical karst. And this is an area called the Cedars. It's another natural area preserved. But how does karst form? Well, it's a chemical process, as I mentioned, it's dissolution of the bedrock, but how does the rock dissolve? Um, in order to get it to dissolve, you need to add a little bit of acidity to rainwater. And that acidity is generated by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When carbon dioxide mixes with water, it forms this weak acid, here is shown in chemical notation, H2CO3. But you take the CO2 and you add the H2O and you get H2CO3, which is a weak acid called carbonic acid, and when that acid in the water interacts with the limestone, the calcium carbonate here, this reaction takes place and you put the calcium and the carbonate into solution. And the rock then is now being carried in the water as mineral deposits. And it flows down and it can, uh, where, where it focuses, the flow is focused, is a, um, within fractures in the limestone rock. Um, often it's these bedding planes that are sort of depicted here in this brick-like pattern where the sediments were laid down initially in a, in a marine environment. Uh, but then the, the sediments get hardened into rock and the rock cracks under tectonic forces. And those fractures then allow near the surface uh, weathering to take place and the, and the rainfall to then seep downward and open them up. And in between you get the soil. And the soil has carbon dioxide concentrations, which can be a hundred to a thousand times that which are in the atmosphere. Um, so uh, really it's quite a, um, uh, a, a generation of, of acid takes place um, uh, quite effectively here at the soil bedrock interface. And as that water drips down or, or flows down through the rock, it may enter a cave passage. And when it does so, um, the carbon dioxide that's in the water now is able to 
degas or come back out into the cave atmosphere. You can kind of think of it like opening up the top of a soda bottle and those bubbles of carbon dioxide start bubbling out and escaping and you can hear the, 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 the hissing of the gas as it's coming out. But when that happens, the water loses its acidity and it loses the ability to hold the calcium carbonate rock in solution. And so that rock starts to re-precipitate and it precipitates out as the same mineral that was dissolved, calcium carbonate, in these types of formations that we call speleothems. Um, these are little soda straw stalactites and it's very common. So that's what's happening. The CO2 is being degassed and the calcium carbonate is precipitating out of the water to form these lovely formations. Uh, here's a, one of my favorite uh, artist depictions of a typical karst landscape in um, southeastern Minnesota, but it's, it's representative of lots of karst around the United States, particularly in the Midwest, where the bedrock is fairly flat lying. And on top of the bedrock, you have some layers of sediment. Um, and the sediment that overlies the bedrock is, again, as I mentioned, generates acidity uh, uh, in, the, in the soils. And so the, the weathering zone right at that interface is, is very irregular um, and uh, contains voids near the, near the top of that interface. And sometimes the sediments are cohesive enough that they actually can host voids themselves. And when those voids in the sediments propagate up to the surface, those are what we call sinkholes. Um, those are the ones that are most dangerous. They're cover collapse sinkholes. Um, and so as you can see in this diagram, you've got lots of different land uses on this terrain, but, but beneath the terrain, there is, uh, there is this zone of voids. And um, when humans interact with those voids by their land use activities, sometimes groundwater can be compromised by pollution. Um, the uh, very commonly we see sinkholes or depressions on the land surface that are filled with trash or unwanted materials. Um, and those uh, can interact with rainwater and pollutants can be tra transferred very quickly down into the bedrock along these solutionally enlarged fractures that I mentioned. Maybe they'll flow down and hit a bedding plane. Oh, sometimes we have uh, septic tanks for houses or industrial areas that are placed right on top of the bedrock. And if those happen to leak, they can leak right down into the groundwater as well. And those flow paths can quickly make their way through the voids in the rock, through a cave passage perhaps, out onto the surface at a spring and flow out onto a stream with almost no natural filtration, kind of like pipes in your home. And that can compromise the stream uh, water quality. And the, and the ecosystem. It can also be a problem for homeowners whose wells may go down and intersect that very flow path, and they end up bringing the water up into their house and it comes out of their tap, um, perhaps carrying the pollutants that were put um, inadvertently, but were added into the groundwater by these kinds of land use activity. Well, let's see where we are in Virginia with respect to the karst in the United States. Now, as opposed to Minnesota, which we were, we were looking at an area like out here, the rocks in Virginia, uh, where most of the karst occurs, are highly folded and faulted. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but just a quick overview of the different types of geology in Virginia, it's quite varied. Um, and we can break it out into these zones, which are physiographic provinces. Um, I've named them here. Uh, we have the coastal plain, which is the flat-lying, uh, fairly recent geology, uh, young sediments that were laid down when sea levels were higher and lapped up onto the land surface. And there were carbonates that were laid down here, but those are not very old. And so the sediments are still kind of like sediments. They're not very hardened into rock yet, not enough time. Then we have out here in the Piedmont, we have some very old uh, rocks that were limestones that were actually turned into marbles in many cases because of metamorphism. Um, the Blue Ridge province is, doesn't have much in the way of carbonate rocks at all. It's mostly igneous and metamorphic rocks. But then we have the great carbonates of the Great Valley and the Valley and Ridge out here. And I've just col color coded them here according to the time period for the most part in which they were laid down. And from now on, I'm pretty much going to focus on the Shenandoah Valley Karst, which is this northern part of uh, Northwestern Virginia. And here's a map of the physiography or sort of just the elevation, color-coded by elevation. So high elevations are in white and lower elevations go down to these 
greens and light blues. Um, states are labeled here, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland. And uh, Newmarket is one of the towns that's central to the Shenandoah Valley. So I've just marked it right there. And um, we can see that there's a lot of ridges and valleys in the Valley and Ridge. <laughs> uh, these are the results of tectonic forces folding and faulting of the, uh, the continental plates when they collided. And um, we're gonna look at uh, what this might look like in profile. So uh, a, a very iconic uh, landform that you see in the middle of the Shenandoah Valley is this, this sort of fissure canoe shaped um, pattern of ridges, which are called uh, Massanutten Mountain and Fort Valley lies in the middle. But this whole area here is Massanutten Mountain. We're just gonna take a look at it from the side and it's as if we were looking at the Southern end. And I'm gonna tilt this in uh, within using Google Earth, which is a wonderful program for visualizing the landscape. And so now we're looking at the Southern end of Massanutten Mountain here. And we can see that there's some ridges with valley in between. So how did that get to be that way? Well, uh, it was because of the um, tectonic forces folding this all, all of this package of, of sediments, rocks and sediments together that formed this kind of a pattern. Um, these, these geologic cross sections are um, pulled up out of the earth. So uh, the land surface is at the top of each of these little planes that you see here, or fences. Um, and if, uh, if uh, what, what this image shows is these little fences pulled up out of the earth so you can get a sense of what's happening in the subsurface. And in general, the way this all got folded up was the rocks of the Blue Ridge over here were pushed against the rocks of the valley here and uh, compressed them, kind of like pushing on the edge of a rug on a hardwood floor and causing them to crumple. And in general, we see this crumpling uh, there's lots of tight folding on either side, but the greater structure here is called a syncline or a fold, which is like a trough. Um, and what's interesting here is these pink, these pink colors you see over here, the different colors indicate the different rock types or, or what we call formations. And all the ones that are pink and yellow and orange, these are all carbonates um, on either side here. And then in the center, these are, um, plastics or sandstones and shales, things that don't dissolve easily in water. But on either side, we have the carbonates, which do dissolve easily in water. And because of that, there's this differential um, erodibility of the rocks. And so the sandstones and the shales, they stick up high and the, the more soluble carbonates are low. So we have this beautiful valley, but it's really geologically, structurally, it's this big fold of a syncline. And because there are many smaller folds within it, we call it a synclinorium. That's a technical term. Uh, zooming in a little bit then on, on what the synclinorium looks like, if you go a little further north towards Winchester, Virginia, um, this is the center of the synclinorium now. Massanutten Mountain would be uh, sort of the center of this fold. And here are the carbonate rocks on either side. And this drawing is to show you the kinds of patterns of water flow that occur in the rocks. Um, because of the exposure to the surface and rainfall interacting with the rocks at the surface. Um, there's lots of shallow, uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, lots of shallow solution and the formation of voids. And so you get these complicated circulatory pathways in the upper, oh, let's say uh, 500 feet or so of the rock surface. But also because these faults go down at depth and water can just follow uh, these planes of weakness, you can also get water that goes to great depth and rises again. And, and we can see that expressed in the warmer waters or warmer springs that we sometimes find in, in this part of the, of the Shenandoah Valley and even further west. I'll mention uh, warm springs a little bit later. Um, so water rising from depth feeds flow onto the surface at springs and, and it creates caves in the subsurface as it's moving through this rock. Um, but so the question might be, where did all this rock come from in the first place? Well, to answer that, we kind of have to send our mind's eye way back to the Ordovician time period, Cambrian and Ordovician time period, um, about 500 million years ago. And this is a paleogeographic reconstruction of what some of the uh, of what the North American continent would have looked like uh, back in that time period. 
Uh, just for reference, you can see faintly the state lines outlined here in parts of the provinces of Canada. And I'll point out where the equator was at that time, because the continental plates have moved around, the equator used to be here. And 30 degrees south latitude would have been here. And that's where Virginia um, pretty much lies at about 30 degrees south latitude. Um, now, let me back up a moment. What you see here in the lighter color is, is a, a very shallow marine shelf. Uh, so this is all seawater that would have lapped up onto the land surface, but the depths of the water would have been pretty shallow, maybe less than 50 meters for the most part, across much of the, the Amer uh, North American continent. And as in, in that environment, um, there was a lot of carbonate production. There were lots of organisms and pr things producing shells that would break down to form the sediments that are the carbonates that we see. And so we call this the Great American Carbonate Bank uh, that occurred in the Cambrian and Ordovician time periods. And if we, again, we focus on uh, 30 degrees south latitude, we can try to find an equivalent or sort of an analogous environment on Earth today. And where we might go to look for that is um, Australia, in particular, Western Australia. And there's a place in Western Australia called the Hamelin Pool where they, where uh, it's one of the few places on the planet where you can still see ancient life forms, life forms that were very prevalent in the Cambrian and Ordovician time periods, um, actively living and, 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 and growing on Earth today. Um, and these are called stromatolites. These are microbial mats, um, my, uh, blue-green algae, that um, create mats in the seawater as it's rising and falling with the tides. Um, and they sequester and they produce a little bit of calcium carbonate in these mounds. Um, and uh, we can see this today happening, um, but we can also see it in the ancient rocks of the Shenandoah Valley. And here's an, here's an ancient fossilized stromatolite mound uh, in some rocks uh, near Briary Branch in Virginia. This is in the uh, Cambrian age, Conigachig limestone. There are also these other types of forms um, called thrombolites. They're very similar to stromatolites, except they're not as well layered. Um, and you can see what they look like in Australia today, little mounds. Um, these are not boulders. They're actually microbial buildups of calcium carbonate. Um, they look kind of like this close up. And if we see some of the fossilized throm thrombolites that exist in Virginia, here, here are some, again, near Briary Branch in the Cambrian Rocks in the Shenandoah Valley. And so that's the environment um, in which uh, these, these rocks were actually formed within back 500 plus, or, uh, 500, between 400 and 500 million years ago. Then the rocks were, were um, as I mentioned, the, the, they were folded and faulted in the Appalachian Mountain Building. Um, this map is a bit complicated, but I'll try to walk you through it. It shows, again, the different rock formations listed here, and it, as if the rocks were just um, unfolded and flat lying again, we reconstruct the stratigraphy or the layering uh, in, in this uh, column here. And so the ones that are cave forming are the carbonates that are here that have the brick-like pattern again, and the, caves, the cave forming um, nature of the rocks is shown by these cavernous zones icon here. So there's this big thick package um, in the Cambrian and Ordovician time period uh, that would have been uh, reflected in those depositional environments that I just showed you in Australia. Uh, and in all, that uh, is about four kilometers of carbonate package at its thickest area. Um, it varies in thickness from place to place, but in total, it's about four kilometers thick, which is really remarkable. As I mentioned, it's the Great American Carbonate Bank. It occurs in Virginia and goes all the way across North American continent. Uh, and if we looked at a cross section then of these folded and faulted rocks, you can see I colored them uh, green and yellow and blue, so you could kind of see where they are. Again, here's Massanutten Mountain, and they form in this big synclinorium, so they're on either side, folded up in a trough on either side, and you can kind of see that reflected in this cross section AA prime. Again, looking looking in a profile from the south to the north. And um, uh, not only are they folded like this, but when we can, using seismic data, we can look very deep and we can see that these are actually duplicated. 
one uh, package of this stratigraphy is thrust up by faulting on top of another package. And so this total thickness here is about eight kilometers of carbonate rock, which enables very deep flow of groundwater um, to occur. We're gonna focus in a little bit on the Newmarket limestone next. It's a little younger in age, it's Ordovician. This is a particularly important limestone in Virginia. It's pure, it's, it's almost 98% uh, pure calcium carbonate. And so it's actually mined and quarried as a chemical uh, uh, source for things like Tums uh, and acid, which is almost entirely calcium carbonate. Um, uh, and this rock formed in a slightly different environment. Um, uh, here's a close up of it. You can kind of see the bedding planes here, the, the, the uh, zone, the flat lying zones where the, where the sediments were laid down. Uh, we can see fossils in this rock that give us an indication of its depositional environment. These happen to be small nautiloids. And you can see the solution uh, along the fracture planes that I mentioned earlier. Um, we'll, get, we'll, we'll see the, more of those later. But these, this rock happened to form in a very similar environment as we find around the Bahamas today. So again, a broad, shallow, what we call a bank, uh, a, a platform, if you will, of uh, carbonate sedimentation that's occurring in this subtropical environment. Um, and so if you were to think about the environment in which the Newmarket limestone formed, it would be very much like the Bahamas. So if you were standing on a nice, island setting with a, uh, a fruity drink in your hand, you would then be projecting your mind's eye back into the time period in the Ordovician when the Newmarket limestone was formed. And Virginia down, was down in here during the Ordovician. This is what um, most of the other plates, this is a reconstruction of the, of the paleogeography during the Ordovician. Of course, those plates didn't stay put. They were moving around by tectonic forces through geologic time. And so as we move into the Permian, that's when the Appalachian Valley and Ridge Mountains were mostly built in the Allegheny and Orogeny. And we had uh, the formation of Pangaea, the supercontinent, um, where some other continents collided and formed this big mountain range. So that would have been the time period where, in which the, um, the mountains were being mostly built. Then later the Pangaea split up in the Triassic and Jurassic and formed um, a, a, a series of rift basins that also filled in with seawater and, and also had some carbonate deposition, but much, much younger. This is Mesozoic time period. This is when the dinosaurs were roaming the planet. And we sometimes find dinosaur fossils in Virginia in some of these Mesozoic basins. Continuing down in, then uh, in, in, into the Cretaceous, uh, younger geologic time, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a time period when sea levels were very high and so we had flooding of the coastal plain, the sort of the low-lying areas near the edge of, of the continent. And there were limestones that were deposited in that time period as well. Finally, we're in our present Cenozoic time period and everything's more or less exposed at the land surface and undergoing weathering and creating the voids that, that uh, are the result of the dissolution from weathering. And if we kind of, again, in profile view, were to try to uh, think of this through a, a series of time slices. Um, the mountains been built up in the late Triassic before they started to get um, totally pulled apart, or some of the basins have already formed at this point, these pull apart basins. But the Great Valley would have been somewhere in here, very high mountains, probably not unlike the Himalaya, actually. They're known to be of great height. Uh, and as those mountains eroded down in, into the Cretaceous, uh, uh, they would have formed more or less a, an eroded planar surface with some small ridges sticking out where the, the quartz rich or, or sandstones and shales would still stick up. And then we have our present day Great Valley down here underlain by limestone rocks. Uh, and even though the rocks are that old, uh, 500 million years uh, and uh, in Cambrian and Ordovician time, uh, they are... Uh, of course, today, the karst, that, that's not the age of the karst. The karst forms later. And so we have to try to use other ways to figure out how old the karst is. One of the most direct ways is when we find fossils that we can date that occur in caves, uh, as, as Mark and Yvonne showed earlier, uh, or that occur in sinkholes that are on the land surface. And one of the most 
relevant and, and spectacular sites uh, and very important for understanding the evolution of the Great Valley, uh, which extends down from Virginia down here into Tennessee, is this site in Tennessee at Gray, Tennessee. It's called the Gray Fossil Site. And it's been dated to about 4 million years old. Now, how do they know that? Well, they, um, the, 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 the site was discovered by um, the Department of Transportation in Tennessee as they were building a road and they cut through a bank of sediment and they noticed that there were fossil bones sticking out of the sediment. So they stopped the construction and they moved the road and they turned this into a museum and an excavation, paleontological excavation site. It's a, it's a wonderful place. It's open to the public. I highly recommend going visiting. And this just shows you, as I mentioned, like a stratigraphic column, sort of a profile view of what the sediments were like. They can reconstruct them. Um, and where, the, where a lot of the bones were found was in here. Now, what I wanna, want you to pay attention to is that these are gray clay-like sediments that probably formed in ponded water at the bottom of a sinkhole. And in that sinkhole fell uh, large animals, animals large and small, um, rhinoceroses and alligators and tapirs. Um, there's some saber-toothed cats and um, just, a, just a whole slew of uh, interesting fauna that date to the Miocene. So that time period, four million years ago. And at that time, uh, Virginia and Tennessee were very much a tropical environment, very warm, very wet. And uh, so the climate was very different than what we have today. Um, and the sinkholes filled in with these sediments and we were just lucky enough to have found them. Um, I'm still looking for one site like this in Virginia. We'll see, maybe we'll find one one day. Uh, what we do find in Virginia are lots of other sinkholes. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, the modern uh, karst environment and the interaction of humans with that environment. Um, these are just some photographs I've taken during some of my, my field work as a, as a geologist with the USGS doing mapping of different sinkhole types. Um, you know, sometimes they're, they're older and they get filled in with rocks that um, land, landowners try to fill in with rocks. Unfortunately, sometimes they try to fill them in with trash, as I mentioned earlier. Um, sometimes they just kind of open up a little bit suddenly. This was just a little throat of a, of a sediment. In, the void was in the sediment, as I mentioned earlier, and it propagated up to the surface. But you can see a little bit of rock peeking out here. So the rock is not far underneath the surface. And this was used uh, by the cattle in this, in this pasture as a little cow wallow. Um, sometimes when new development happens, that's very common when uh, sinkholes occur because humans disturb the landscape and when they disturb the hydrology, the water finds new pathways to get underground and can cause problems sometimes by creating voids that propagate to the surface. And sometimes they're just there in the rock and you may not even know it. This is just a little uh, uh, void underneath some tree roots that when you look down into it, it's, it's just all rock. Um, but there's a hole that goes down about 25 feet. More pictures of, of, of solution in the bedrock around the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, you often find them where, again, there's fractures in the rock. So the water finds these pathways to flow down. Um, I mentioned the soil and the soil uh, produces CO2. And so often you'll find uh, these are filled with pockets of soil. But when the soil gets excavated out or peeled away, um, you can see that some of these voids go quite deep into the subsurface. In fact, in this uh, particular photograph, we actually did a dye trace. Uh, Mark and Yvonne mentioned dye tracing before because we wanted to figure out where water that flows down this small hole might go. And it was uh, because of a, it was near a, a housing development. And uh, we were concerned about the, uh, the, the cattle in the cow pasture, um, perhaps uh, compromising the groundwater quality. So we put dye down this hole and it came out of a homeowner's well looking like Gatorade. So the dye itself is non-toxic. It's highly fluorescent though in this green color. Uh, and it came out the homeowner's tap um, almost at the concentration that we put it in. And it traveled about uh, 100 meters, didn't go very far, but it came out uh, of their tap very quickly. And um, it just goes to show that there are very direct connections between the land surface and the groundwater, and in particular, the, the, the areas where people have uh, wells that go down into the bedrock and they use that water for domestic supply. Uh, fortunately, this landowner had um, a very good water purification system on their, on their, on their well. 
uh, source and uh, the dye passed uh, in about a week and, and nothing really um, harmful came as a result of this. But then the, the, the benefit to the landowner was that now they know that part of the source of their water is that, that pasture just adjacent to their property. Uh, in the course of doing geologic mapping then, we try to document the geology or the, the, the structure that is the fracturing and the folding of the rock that may have some control on the development of the karst. Here's an example at Hupps Hill in Stroudsburg, Virginia. It's a great site. Um, it has a cave on the site called Crystal Caverns. Um, it used to be a tour cave. It's currently closed, but hopefully it'll be opened up again at some point. But there is a trail that you can walk around on the surface that the cave board helped to develop. Um, it's an interpretive trail. So I highly recommend stopping in and taking a, and having a visit at some point. Um, and, and this is just to show you some of the, the, the closed depressions and sinkholes that have occurred in these limestones. The different colors, again, that you're seeing here are different rock formations. Um, OP is the Ordovician Pinesburg Station Dolomite. ON is the Ordovician New Market Limestone. We saw that earlier. Uh, then we have OL is the Lincolnshire limestone, and OE is the Edinburgh limestone. And these these are all um, these Ordovician rocks are actually the the rocks that host the most common uh, uh, clustering or density of sinkholes in Virginia. Um, and when they get fractured, then these sinkholes tend to line up along these fracture zones in different places. Now there's a quarry here that's no longer active and it's full of water. We're gonna just take a look at that quarry now. Uh, oh, there's Crystal Caverns. We're gonna look at the sinkhole adjacent to the quarry. And this was one that uh, was next to a homestead. Um, and uh, my colleague, David Weary is standing down here in the sinkhole where you can see that it had been used for decades as a, a convenient place, <laughs> a sort of a personal landfill to, to host trash and unwanted material. And again, that's not a good thing uh, because it causes uh, groundwater contamination. Well, we're going to take a little, if we now walk uh, away from this sinkhole towards the edge of the quarry, which is here, we're going to look back and get a, get a nice uh, view of what the rock and uh, sediments look like um, underneath this, this surface here. And what they look like, here's that, whole, here's that old cabin and the sinkhole is just off to the right here, but here's what you see in the rock that causes the sinkhole to be there. It's a void in the bedrock formed along these fracture planes. Now this is the plane of bedding of the, uh, the zone of which the sediments were written, originally uh, laid down upon this horizontal plane. This vertical plane is a fracture and where those two meet is where a lot of groundwater solution of the rock occurs because it happens to be nice preferential flow path. So we often find caves at the intersections between vertical fractures, which are called joints, and bedding plane fractures. And I'll show you more examples of that in a moment. But, but this void, then the sediments that are up here slowly ravel down into this void and create the sinkhole or the type of closed depression that we just saw previously. And here I am standing atop one I probably shouldn't be that close, but <laughs> uh, there's probably a little bit of a rock bridge here I wouldn't want to stand above this uh, if there was a soil bridge, but if there wasn't a quarry here, you wouldn't really know that there was a void this size. And, and the, the truth is that these kinds of voids are common throughout the landscape uh, in karst areas, and that's what makes them vulnerable to sinkhole hazards and to groundwater contamination hazards. Uh, here's a map of another tour cave in Virginia, Shenandoah Caverns, beautiful cave. Um, for the most part, this little symbol here is showing you the strike and dip or the, the way the, the, bed, uh, the bedding of the rock is oriented. Um, let's just jump to a view inside the cave and I'll show you what I mean. So here again are these lines that you see in the rock. These are the bedding planes in which the sediments were initially laid down, would have been horizontal in the marine environment. And so this fracture here is a bedding plane fracture, but it's cross cut by, and it's dipping at 45 degrees. And so we can see that uh, symbolized in map view by this symbol, but it's cross cut by a joint fracture here. And that's where the cave passage is pretty much following. So water was flowing along that intersection and then opening up and dissolving away the rock around that flow path to create, to create the open void that we can now explore as a cave. 
Another cave uh, that's a beautiful tour cave in Virginia is Grand Caverns. It's one of my favorites um, down near Harrisonburg. Uh, Grottoes is the town where it's located. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to visit. It's a, it's a cave that's also very much guided in its formation by fractures and bedding planes in the bedrock. And so it's it, in plan view here. So what you're looking at here is a, again, a LIDAR derived image of the topography. Um, this is the uh, south branch of the Shenandoah River or South River here. Um, and this is the entrance driveway that you drive in to get to the, the building uh, where you can purchase tickets and you can take a tour of the cave. Once you purchase your tickets, you walk up this pathway and you enter the cave somewhere here where they have an entrance building. And then you can see uh, just a little bit of what's actually shown here. The tour only goes in around this area. Um, and then this is the map that you'll see in the, in the building, uh, in the tour cave. In the, I'm sorry, in the, build, the, 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 the interpretive center of the, build, of the, the tour cave. Um, what I want to highlight here is this uh, ridge. I'll jump back a second. This sort of light colored ridge that you see through here that's all folded up, that's sandstone that's occurring within the carbonate. And it, it, it hold, it's, a, it's a high point on the land surface in a sense. It's a more, not high, but it's uh, elevated relative to the rocks around it because it's resistant. It's sandstone and quartz rich. And it shows you very nicely the structure that's here. So this is a, a series of two folds. It's an anticline here and a syncline here. And you can see the sinkholes that are um, uh, pockmarking the carbonate rock near the land surface. But Grand Caverns is formed in sort of the center of this fold, this anticlinal fold. And we can kind of see that if we look at these profile views here, we can see that this is um, more or less flat lying rock through, through this profile over here. But over here, the rock is almost vertical. And that's because of the folding. When you get in the cave, um, one of the more diagnostic features of Grand Caverns are these water lines or these, uh, these what are sometimes referred to as bathtub rings. Um, it's, it's not a technical term, but it's uh, where groundwater had once ponded within the cave and then precipitated out calcium carbonate as sort of a coating on the cave walls. And you can see multiple water levels and coatings of calcium carbonate that occur in the cave. Um, and it shows you that the cave not only uh, formed from flowing water, but also um, the water moved up and down multiple times through, through the history of the formation of the cave. And where did it come from? Well, it, it's groundwater. Um, it would have been in connection with the South River over here. And it's not the only cave that shows that. There are several caves on Cave Hill. Uh, and uh, Grand Caverns is just the largest. There's also Fountain Cave, which is formed in this uh, fold over here, and Steggers Fissure and Madison Saltpeter Cave. The Madison Saltpeter Cave is, is a very significant cave. Um, it has uh, also these, these features of rising and falling groundwater, but note that, it, that the extent of the mapped passage uh, goes down below the level of South River which gives us some clues as to how the cave formed. It really did form from waters rising from below, ponding and then falling again. And on the tour, just so you know, if you, if you ever take a tour of Grand, if you want to see where the, the, the water lines are most well expressed, um, stop and they'll talk about them in the still water room. And you can see these ancient pool levels in the still water room. Uh, here's looking into Madison Saltpeter Cave now, looking down the, the, the passage to the, the lower pool. Uh, there's a caver for scale, and you can see that this pool is coated with calcite. It looks like uh, maybe some kind of soap scum, but it's not. It's not. It's the mineral calcium carbonate reprecipitating at the surface of the water. As I mentioned, the carbon dioxide that's in the water is degassing, and so you get the, the precipitation of the rock minerals um, right at that surface interface between the water and the open void of the cave passage. Um, and so this shows us that this water has been sitting underground for quite a long time uh, and has really dissolved a lot of rock, gotten to the point where it's completely saturated and it can precipitate the rock out again. Um, uh, but this is even most significant for the biology. 
Uh, the Madison, Salt, Madison Cave is uh, host to the Madison Cave Isopod or Entralana Lyra. I'm not gonna say much more about this because um, our colleague Katarina kosic fitko is going to talk more about the biology of caves uh, in a little later on. Um, when the water like that, that's in Madison Cave or other caves actually flows out onto the land surface at springs, as I mentioned, because it's saturated with the, the carbonate rock that it's dissolved, it can re-precipitate that not just in a cave, but also out on the land surface. And when that happens, we call those, uh, in geologic terms, we call those deposits of travertine or marl um, or tufa. Those three words are sometimes used interchangeably. They all mean surface deposits of calcium carbonate. Um, but the, the difference is in sort of the form that they take. So travertine is generally very dense and well layered. Uh, marl is more of a sediment. It's not very well consolidated. Um, and tufa is hard, but very porous, not very dense. Um, and so those are the, the descriptors and how they're used interchangeably. Um, and there's a very nice publication put out by the Virginia Geological Survey on where you find these deposits um, and, and where they are scattered out throughout Virginia. Several of them were mined actually for agricultural lime, uh, sort of a, a sweetener, if you will, or to, to change the pH of the soil and improve the agricultural productivity of some of the soils. And so I'll show you an example of one of those um, up here near Winchester, Virginia, along Red Bud Run. Um, this is a, a, a map. You can see the West Virginia, Virginia state line here. Winchester, the city of Winchester is right around here. And what I've depicted on this map here are these yellow zones are the streams, stream channels that host the marl soils and the travertine and tufa deposits. And these blue areas are areas where from aerial photographs during wet periods, we can define uh, rising groundwater, groundwater coming up out of the ground. Um, and most of these are fed by discrete springs, but not all of them. And uh, this is the area of Red Bud Run that I mentioned, where the soils are very rich in marl. And this is a hardened marl or tufa. Uh, they were mining it out. This is the part of the old mine workings there. It's no longer active. Um, and then this is one where it wasn't mined, but still a nice natural spot where you can see as the calcium carbonate is flowing over the land surface, um, it creates these sort of dams of, of precipitated rock and pools behind them, and you get a series of cascades. And that's a, a very nice spot, uh, a common swimming hole for high school kids at uh, the uh, confluence of Spout Run in Clark County, where it meets the Shenandoah River. Really lovely spot. Uh, again, trying to put this into a, a profile view so you can get a sense of how the water is coming up out of the ground. Um, this is from the work of David Hubbard, a uh, former uh, Cape Board member and geologist with the, the state of Virginia. Um, and he's depicted it nicely here where you have faults or, or fracture zones in the bedrock that form these preferential flow paths for water to rise up and flow out onto the surface at springs. And when that happens, of course, is the, the, the rock, uh, there's a lot of dissolved rock in the water and CO2 as well. And so the CO2 starts to degas. And as the water is flowing across the surface and the CO2 is degassing, carbonate starts to precipitate out and form these laminated buildups and soils behind in these, into these cascades. And the turbulence that's caused by the cascades actually helps enhance the outgassing of the CO2. And so you actually get um, even more buildups at these waterfalls. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'll just show you again. One of the more spectacular examples of this process is at Falling Spring Falls near Covington, Virginia. Um, here's a, here's what you, a view of it from the road. You can pull off the road and, and uh, get a nice uh, photograph of it. This is taken in wintertime. Um, and you can also hike down and see it from below. And there's a person here for scale. I don't know if you can see that. It's very small. but um, yeah, there we go. There's a person for scale. Um, beautiful site, uh, well worth visiting. And these are some of the, this is about the height of the waterfalls, about 60 feet high. And you can see the, uh, the ponds and the pools in the cascades uh, 
formed by the precipitation of the calcium carbonate out on the surface. Now this happens to be fed by um, a stream coming out of a cave called Warm River Cave. And the reason the cave has that name is because the water is actually um, heated to naturally by moving deep into the, in, the, in the subsurface to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's that temperature all year round. And so it's a very, uh, another popular swimming spot. That's my presentation. Um, I hope that next time you get a chance to visit and enter a cave, you will think not only about the cave environment, but also the water that's flowed through that uh, rock to form the cave. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Wow, Dan, thank you. I, um, I just learned a lot. <laughs> Any questions for anybody? There's actually one in the chat from Essie Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in knowing how you are using um, mathematics um, in your surveying, in your observations, in your research about the cave. Oh, goodness. Uh, boy, that's a very broad question. Um, how do we use mathematics? Well, uh, in several ways. Um, uh, when we do, well, for example, when I do geologic mapping, um, I, I mentioned those strike and dips where we try to measure the angles of things. So geometry is so key to understanding the structure of rocks. Once they're folded and faulted, we only see the results of that folding and faulting. But to reconstruct how it happened, we have to use geometry. Um, and I'll just, maybe I can jump backwards. Let's see. Don't know if it'll let me, yeah, okay. Uh, real quick. So here, um, when we do mapping, uh, we make measurements with a compass on the angles, but to put it all together, um, we use geometry. And so here you have a symbol that's showing you uh, the, uh, the azimuth or the orientation in 360 degrees of this plane of uh, the, the, the strike of the rock, which is the intersection, it's a line. And that line is the intersection between a horizontal plane and this line here, which is the dip of the bedding plane fracture. So if you intersect a horizontal plane with this, you get this angle, 45 degrees in, in dip, but you also get a line that's oriented in 360 degrees in compass direction. And that's called the azimuth. And we take all these measurements and we do these kinds of uh, angle measurements. And then with geometry, we can reconstruct, let's say the thickness of the rock units um, across the, the surface um, using Pythagorean theorem. So that's one simple example, but mathematics is certainly key to all kinds of measurements. When we measure water flow, we want to estimate the discharge of flow through the cross section of a stream. Uh, we have to know not just geometry, but a little bit of calculus as well. Um, oh, I could go on and on. Uh, do you have a particular uh, uh, type um, of that, that 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 really highlighted um, information I needed to know. My other question would be, um, uh, are there any specific tools? Like in a previous video, someone showed that they had like a laser beam of light that was able to measure the distance from one point to another. Are there any specific tools that you would use that I could like use as a demonstration in a classroom? Oh, um, well, if you, if you were to able to buy a laser pointer, um, okay. could, or, or something you might use for a presentation, um, you could talk about that as um, light is reflected from a laser pointer back to the source of the light. Um, the, uh, the distance is determined by the time it takes for the light to go from its source, reflect and come back. Um, and, and then you, you determine that by using the speed of light. Um, that velocity. So you can calculate distance by knowing the velocity um, of the light moving uh, from the source to be reflected back to the source. So that's sort of a simple mathematical 
equation that is used to calculate distance using a laser pointer. To the distance, I should say, from the source to something it's reflected off of and back to the source. Thank you very much. Now this, this day field up in Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, have you used uh, electrical resistivity or gravity measurements or anything like that to try to find uh, caves or you know where they go to? And you know, do you have the instruments to do that? Yes, we do. Uh, I have used it. I didn't want to focus on that. That's a great question. Um, that kind of geophysical surveying um, is is extremely important when trying to. Uh, investigate, let's say, a site that you want to do some kind of new development on. It's very important to do a, a geophysical survey um, prior to developing the site to get a sense of what kind of voids you may encounter in the subsurface prior to, let's say, building a house foundation or, or putting in some kind of other um, water conveyance infrastructure, uh, pipes for, let's say, stormwater uh, sewers. Um, and I've done that kind of... Uh, Surveying, yes, electrical resistivity works very well for that. Okay, all right, thanks. Any other questions? We're getting close to the top of the next hour and the next speaker. Dan, thank you so much. And you can stop, yeah, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, anybody else? Questions, okay. Hey, hi, Dan, this is Wyatt Nash. I have a quick question. Um, the the fracture line and the bedding plane line, are they typically perpendicular to each other? Not always, no. Um, uh, and typically, that's a, that's a hard question to answer. It depends on where you are on a, a particular structure. So um, in flat line rocks, let's say out in, in the Midwest, Minnesota, Kentucky, Iowa, Indiana, very often joints tend to be vertically oriented or sub-vertical, very close to vertical. So that's very commonly seen in flat lying rocks. When you get rocks like in Virginia and they're folded and faulted, the joint patterns can be at many different angles um, because it's complicated structure. Thank you. Okay. Um, Good presentation, thank you. 